So, since we are recording, uh, we're already going to start. The replay is going to be available for you if you've just registered as well. So, let's get started. First of all, hi and welcome um, to Navigating the Open Source Battery Management System. My name is Anna and I work for the NAXIS Foundation. What we do is we fund and support open innovation within the energy access sector. And today, together with Libra Solar, we've organized this conversation to broaden the understanding of how open source innovations can positively impact your business, as well as teach you how to get started with navigating and using open source materials. And in and in the next hour or so, you will hear from Martin Jaeger. He is the lead engineer at Libra Solar, and he's also the developer of the open source battery management system. And Libra Solar's mission is to help provide energy access for everyone, also to reclaim the energy supply using affordable, renewable energy solutions. And that is all based on open source hardware as well. And then I'm also very happy to introduce our CEO, Vivian Barnier. He will talk to Martin about his experience with developing a BMS. And Martin will also show you how to get started with navigating all of the open source materials that you will be using when you integrate the BMS yourself. And at the end, everyone who is attending, you will get the opportunity to have any of the questions that come up during this event answered by Martin and Vivian. So I very strongly encourage you to keep sending in those questions through using the chat feature, as well as you can drop your name and what you do as well. And I am now excitedly handing it over to Vivian, who will now give you a short presentation on NAXIS and how open source projects impact the energy access sector. So, the floor is all yours, Vivian. Thank you, Anna, for this uh, nice introduction uh, to today's webinar. And hello and welcome also from my side to all participants. Um, I will short a few words about myself. Um, before joining uh, the Nexus Foundation to lead its on this mission to push open source innovations in the energy access sector. I worked uh, in the private sector in the, for the energy access mainly uh, on mini grids on pretty much every aspect from developing, implementing, operating mini grids and providing consultancy service to all kinds of stakeholders from private companies to donors and public institutions and regulators. Um, and today I'm excited to use this experience uh, to push more open source into the sector because working in the, op uh, in the private sector, I noticed why we need open innovations. And let me explain you a bit more about the mission we uh, work on at Annexis. As I guess most of the participants here now, um, electrifying rural areas with sustainable and affordable energy, both very important points, um, comes with a lot of challenges and for, for that reason requires innovative and new approaches to overcome these challenges. So energy access organizations that, like the ones you're possibly running require to develop innovations to contest these challenges that you encounter which makes a lot of sense. However, from our experience and my personal experience as well, a lot of time these energy access organizations end up reinventing the wheel instead of focusing on reaching more end customers. This means you come up with a challenge and say, oh, I need a solution for that. Develop a, uh, you develop a solution and then by the end you possibly notice actually that's a challenge that most of the other companies I'm working with or which are around me uh, are encountering as well. And the solution I came up with is pretty similar or even the same, even though I used mostly donor money, often from the same donor to come up with the same solution. So we believe these basic solutions that are required to actually come to the end customers should 
to be developed in a more open source way to actually allow sharing and vital development of the sector. So what do we do about that? We promote and support the development of open source innovations in energy access and support and promote the adoption of these for a broader standardization of tools used in the energy access sector. We do these to build an equitable and fair ecosystem where more local companies can participate in universal access to energy because we believe the basic tools to work through its electrification don't need to have any ip of it we believe companies need ip to to develop their business to have a, their usp however a lot of the basic tasks that need to be done can be based on open source technology solutions and business models, which are available or still have to be developed. And these will allow more companies to participate on this goal. So what are the concrete steps that we do about it? We support, we curate and we promote. In our support, what we do is we identify technology and tools that are missing in the sector, that the energy access sector is not having today, but there are challenges which would need these tools. And then we support and engage and fund the development of these innovations and push the, uh, the broad adoption in the sector of these open source innovations. As a second work, what we do is curate. We curate um, and maintain a repository with high quality and easy to use and adopt open innovations. And we constantly work on the improvement and maintenance and, uh, and ease of adoption uh, of these innovations. As the sector evolves, also the tools have to evolve. As new players come in, a new way of adopting and of approaching the tools is required, so we take over this work. And as a third uh, part of our work we promote, that's the reason why you today are here and listening to this webinar. We do promotional activities around open source in general for the energy access sector and particularly on open source innovations, which we have funded uh, and supported in their development for the sector. We do this through webinars, articles, podcasts, newsletters, etc. And just to give you a short brief on the open innovations that, uh, that we have in our repository, let me start from the very top on the left, I mean left middle. There's the open Pago token that I believe most of you might be aware of, especially if you work with Pago systems. The open Pago token system is an um, openly available code to encrypt and decrypt tokens for Pago uh, uh, usage in solar home systems, solar pumps, or whatever devices used in the energy access sector. Then there's the survey toolkit developed by Devergy, which provides energy access companies with a tool to easily assess and survey communities, regions they might want to electrify. Then there has Airlink developed by Simo Solar, which is a relay extension of the internet to allow even for the most remote assets to be connected to an IoT functionality using smartphones as data carriers for data and low energy and low cost Bluetooth technology. Then there's the battery management system, which I won't explain now. We also have uh, funded and developed the Cicada uh, modules, where, which include firmware and hardware where we have Wi-Fi and GSM and 4G modules, which can be plugged in on existing assets or in future development of assets can be integrated and uh, are completely open source, which makes the integration and usage uh, to any new device you're developing easier. Then we have an open smart meter to meter AC energy, which has been developed by the Nigerian company in, in Nigeria and has also been pro produced there already, which has a GSM functionality to allow IoT capability. Um, then on the less hardware software side, but more business model and concept side, we have 
the DOAC initiative, the Distributed Renewable Energy Certificates initiative, which allows decentralized energy companies, like some of those listening to us today, to participate on the renewable energy certificates markets, which were closed or unlocked for them so far, because the work of filling out PDF forms to report the energy you have produced is just not viable for a solar home system or even for mini grid. So the DWAC initiative is providing an optimized platform for collecting data on renewable energy production by decentralized energy systems and allows to monetize them. And lastly, the aggregate business model, which is a business model which integrates agricultural pre manufacturing and processing with energy pro producing. So the company engaged in energy production, energy retail is also engaging in agricultural pre processing and leveraging on the logistical capacities, uh, which already are set up to push both uh, businesses. Uh, more forward. So the agricultural processing needs energy, but also needs the logistical capacities. The mini grid uh, company has logistical capacities and is providing energy and combining these both is uh, creating a more viable business model. So let's come to today's main topic, the open battery management system, which has been developed and is currently being implemented by Libra Solar. So I will be happy to hand over to Martin Jäger, the CEO and lead developer of Libre Solar, to give us a short intro on the Open BMS. Yeah, hello everyone, and uh, thanks Vivian for the introduction. Um, yeah, uh, so we developed this BMS that you see on the screen uh, together with the Annexus Foundation, uh, which provided funding for the development. And I'm very happy to talk about uh, our experiences during the development and uh, yeah, what we learned um, today with you. So first of all, uh, you probably want to know what a battery management system is if you don't uh, have uh, yeah, that much experience with developing batteries yourself. Uh, so I'll shortly explain this. Uh, it is basically the, the heart of every modern uh, battery. So especially if they are uh, based on, or if they are based on lithium iron or lithium iron phosphate cells, uh, then you will always need a battery management system. And the battery management system will protect the battery and at the same time monitor uh, the cells uh, that they are always operated in their um, yeah, uh, correct operating range. So the operating range is of course the voltage and the current, but also the temperatures uh, where they are allowed to be used in. And the battery management system takes care of that. And if something goes wrong, it would switch off the current and uh, protect the battery cells so that yeah, nothing can happen to them. Um, yeah, and uh, one additional important aspect of the battery management system is that it provides more insights into the battery. So it provides data um, from measurements inside the battery management system. So, for example, the current and the voltages of the individual cells, uh, temperatures and so on. And all these uh, functions are integrated into this board. And uh, yeah. So we have uh, on the left side, we've got the, the high power part uh, where you can connect the thick cables for the, um, yeah, from the, coming from the cells and going to the outside of the battery. So uh, the, yeah, the, the cables going to the cells would come from here. And then you see these huge MOSFET switches, which uh, can switch off the battery uh, charging or discharging path depending on the conditions the batteries are in. Also, we've got a current measurement uh, with a shunt, shunt, which is shown here. And uh, then we've got some connections uh, which can be integrated into the, yeah, or used for other components inside a battery pack. So normally you would use this component, component the BMS, and then include it into your battery pack product. And uh, you would probably have an on off switch or you would have a display or any other um, communication interfaces to interface with inverters, for example. And all these interfaces are provided by the BMS and are shown here. 
The one is the on-off switch, uh, which can put the battery into a deep sleep mode uh, where it hardly consumes any energy and so it can be stored for a long period of time. Uh, then we've got some communication interfaces shown at the bottom. Uh, one important one is the CAN bus, which is used in uh, lots of automotive applications, but also um, yeah, in, in uh, off-grid applications because it's a really reliable protocol and it can be used to connect many batteries in parallel or talk to an inverter or talk to other systems in the, in the system. Um, then we've got the I2C protocol for more user interface stuff like a display that could be integrated into the battery pack. And we've got a USB connection to update the firmware and a UART a serial interface for different purposes like GSM modules, which are talking on serial interface, or you could use it uh, for Modbus connections with RS485 um, transceiver attached to it. So there's really lots of possibilities how to connect the BMS. And yeah, for that, of course, you also need uh, to be flexible on the firmware side. So I will talk about that later. Um, coming back to the yeah, more hardware specifications, uh, so our BMS can handle up to 16 cells in series, and those cells would be connected at the uh, right side. And uh, each cell is monitored uh, on its own. And uh, yeah, with 16 cells in series, you can reach a pack voltage of 48 volts nominal with lithium iron phosphates. And that's the really the most typical use case for slightly higher power applications, but not high voltage. So it's still safe to touch but it provides sufficient amount of uh, power to be able to use it in mini grid applications, for example. And yeah, the maximum current is 100 amps, uh, depending on the amount of uh, heat sink you put behind the BMS. Uh, if you don't need that amount of current, you can also reduce the components on the board easily and uh, make the BMS a little bit cheaper. You can connect basically any type of cells, uh, for example, uh, the nickel cobalt manganese cells, which are often used in, uh, yeah, in laptops and so on, and cars, because they have uh, very high energy density, but they're also a little bit more expensive. So for off-grid applications, the most typical cell would probably be the lithium iron phosphate cell, LFP. And, uh, but there it's also possible to connect any newer technologies uh, because uh, the parameters for the cells are flexibly configurable. And yeah, as I already mentioned, we've got lots of different communication interfaces. The one that I didn't mention yet is Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Uh, these are provided by the ESP32 C3 chip you see at the bottom. And that's also the main microcontroller that, uh, yeah, provides all these interfaces. Yeah, that's basically the, the introduction to the BMS itself. Great. Thank you, Martin. Uh, quite impressive also. I mean, um, the just I had it in my hand already and also seeing it uh, again here that you have achieved this, uh, this work um, in, in such short time with uh, this limited resources and your small team, but uh, impressed on the result. And um, I, I would like to, to make you some questions um, on, on the BMS. Um, so it, it would be interesting to, to learn a bit more for me and for the participants uh, on what, what makes this open source battery management system so different from uh, proprietary versions uh, of a BMS. Um, and which problems have you encountered or have been reported to you from people using or wanting to use a BMS, which is proprietary? So, um, yeah, I know you have prepared some information on that. So maybe you could uh, enlighten us a bit more on, on this aspect. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think one of the key aspects is really the open source uh, nature of the BMS because uh, yeah, if something is open source, you can uh, change it and customize it as you want. Uh, because you can uh, either tune the hardware, tune the software, which is usually more easy. Uh, and um, yeah, 
adopt it to your application as you need it. And with proprietary designs, uh, usually you have one dedicated set of functions. And if it doesn't really suit your application, for example, communication protocols, there are so many communication protocols out there. Uh, some batteries uh, talk with uh, proprietary protocols, same for inverters and so on. And if uh, your communication protocol doesn't work for the BMS, then they can't work with each other. So uh, you can, with an open BMS, you can uh, just uh, change the firmware and then uh, you get these functions. So um, our BMS was designed with uh, KiCad, which is an open source software as well which is also very important because uh, it uh, lowers the barrier to uh, adoption and usage of the BMS. Uh, so if it was designed with a yeah, software like, I don't want to name any, but there are some softwares out there used in the industry, which cost uh, tens of thousands of euros, uh, then yeah, the open source aspect is useless because you need a license for that uh, expensive program. But with KiCad, uh, yeah, you get professional grade PCB design software for free. So that's what we use for the design. Then uh, for the firmware, we've chosen to uh, take uh, Zephyr Artos as the basis for our application development. And the Zephyr project is, uh, we are part of the Linux Foundation. So it's also backed by a huge open source community. And uh, that's really one of the main advantages um, that it has lots of features already built in so if you want to change to a different uh, communication protocol it's already there you just need to kind of enable it and then you can use it uh, with the bms and it's also continuously improved and actively developed um yeah and for the communication we are using some uh, open communication protocols uh, partly developed at libre solar i will show that later on um, yeah, but you can, as mentioned, easily adopt it to whatever you need in your application. Yeah, one other aspect uh, of open source versus proprietary is also the cost of the product. So, um, of course, uh, if you want to use the BMS inside your uh, battery pack, you don't need to pay for the development anymore or only need to uh, pay for the additional development you need for customization. And that's uh, especially for small companies, very important aspect. So you can develop your product around the BMS. Um, yeah, and uh, one other aspect in proprietary designs uh, I have encountered is that sometimes you don't even know what the features of the BMS are or how much current you can draw through the BMS uh, because there's a data sheet that states just very rough numbers and um, yeah, you can't really judge if that's really true or the communication protocol is not properly defined and you have to try to reverse engineer it and, and try to understand it. And in our case, uh, everything is open. Even if it's not well documented on a higher level, you can just look into the code and you'll see how it works. Yeah, great, Martin. Yeah, great feedback. Yeah, that, that's that's true. Even though you don't find the information at the first place, you have the chance to look up everything you want to look up, even though, I mean, I, I see you have well documented, but in talking generally about open source, it, it might not be the case, but you always have the chance to get the information you want and are not stuck in a hotline for hours to find out some information from a customer, so which is possibly not even existing. Your point on the current is actually already a question for later in the Q&A, um, but we will answer it. Um, so let, let's move to another point, which is, uh, I think, very interesting also on the potential of open source in general and what we as an access also stand for and want to push. And I, I discussed the example of the open smart meter, which is locally developed in, in Nigeria and has been uh, manufactured there already. So how is the possibility of uh, manufacturing the PCBA of the, of the BMS locally? So what equipment is required? Which, which machinery besides the parts, of course, uh, <laughs> should you to source from somewhere? Um, but yeah, which machineries, which equipment would a lab uh, production facility need to be able to produce the, the BMS as it is designed right now? 
Um, yeah, so we tried to design the, the BMS uh, such that it can still be manually assembled. As you have seen, it's uh, containing almost uh, entirely just SMD parts, so surface mount devices and not the uh, older through hole technology. Um, but the size of the parts is still not the, the smallest you can see in uh, like smartphones and so on. Uh, and yeah, for lots of the parts, you can't even get these uh, through hole components, get them in packages with through hole components. So you have to use SMD parts and uh, soldering them manually is still possible. So um, either you can use uh, yeah, tweezers or if you have access to a manual pick and place machine, it com becomes a little bit more easy. Um, so you can have a look into this picture, uh, which is the pick and place machine in our fab lab, uh, which is also a manual one. Uh, it has a small suction nozzle and uh, with that you can place the parts on the PCB. It takes a while, but it's uh, possible to do it by hand. And uh, yeah, also for rework and so on, you can still do that uh, per hand, by hand. What you need as material is uh, you need the PCB, of course, and the parts, and you will need a stencil to apply the, the solder paste. Uh, the solder paste can be seen in the pictures. It's the, the gray, uh, small gray uh, yeah, cream on the, on the golden pads. And these are used uh, to uh, yeah, connect the, the parts with the PCB. And the process is that you apply the solder paste with the stencil. Then uh, you place the parts and afterwards you put the whole assembly in, into a reflow oven. And then it, uh, yeah, a temperature profile of up to 250 degrees is applied and then the PCB is ready. These reflow ovens are also not very expensive. Uh, so the one we use costs 250 euros. Um, so it is doable on a small scale. Uh, but of course, uh, there are lots of parts and you don't want to produce 100, hundreds of uh, boards this way. So it would be more recommended for prototyping. And then uh, afterwards, uh, you would use an automatic pick and place machine and some more professional equipment. Yeah, we had during the design phase, uh, one little aspect you can see in this uh, picture, we were originally planning to use press fit connectors uh, which are yeah can can handle quite high currents, but we finally decided to go for just SMD connectors because it makes the assembly to the heatsink easier and it reduces one of the manufacturing steps and you need one machine less. But for these connectors, uh, they have quite a huge thermal mass, so the process of soldering has to be yeah this has to be considered in the soldering process so that the, the solder is really getting uh, melted properly. Okay, great. Thank you for, for, for these insights. They're very helpful and detailed. And um, just a very quick one for the PCB. I mean, you need the PCB printing like facility where you can order this, but there's, it's not like anything very particular about your PCB design, which like a, would ever like manufacturing that can produce PCBs could produce your PCB. Um, well, yeah, it's a good question. So we are talking about power electronics here and you need uh, thick copper layers mm -hmm. in the PCB. Uh, so the usually very cheap manufacturers uh, from China, they may not offer the correct copper thickness. So okay. we're currently using 70 micrometers and uh, often you get only 35 micrometers or less. And then it would not be possible or only for a much lower current. Okay. So, yeah. Good detail. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I am just another quick one on, I remember, I mean, in, in the process we work with you on, on the development on it, that there were some problems about sourcing uh, pieces for the development, which you encountered, which possibly people working in the industry are also aware of that sourcing uh, uh, lately has been quite challenging. So if, if you could, say a few words about the, the sourcing and how you have mitigated and what does that mean for the replicability of the BMS in the in the near or long term for future. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a tricky topic indeed. So 
So uh, when we started the project, we were really like, oh, uh, there's this chip crisis. Are we getting something to work at all? And then we decided on some chips and uh, ordered enough chips. Uh, for example, this uh, BQ chip from Texas Instruments, which is the core uh, cell monitoring chip. Uh, yeah, we ordered a few of them so that we have them uh, in stock and then design the PCB so that you don't get into the situation that you've got a finished design and don't get the chips anywhere. The situation has relaxed a little bit, but still uh, some of the chips like this BQ chip are not readily available everywhere, not, not with the, uh, the big distributors like DGK and Mauser. And you can only get them at some Chinese suppliers uh, on AliExpress, for example. So that's still tricky, but it looks like it's going to relax a bit more in the future. Uh, two other components which were tricky were the switch mode power supply uh, IC, which is the component that uh, translates the higher battery voltage into the voltage required by the microcontroller. And that's a component that's in every uh, yeah, electronics equipment. Uh, but yeah, so they were also out of stock. Uh, the one we are currently using is in stock again. And uh, also there's a better one which we couldn't get when we designed the PCB. That one is also in stock again. And for MOSFETs, the original Infineon one that we planned is still not in stock, but we got some replacements. And uh, always if we had replacements, we noted them in the uh, PCB, in the schematic. So you can have a look and see, okay, if this one is not available, maybe you have to reduce your current a little bit, but then you can still manufacture the board and have some replacement parts. Yeah, at the very beginning, we thought that we could uh, build a board with uh, several different options of microcontrollers because they were most critical. Uh, but uh, yeah, they needed a lot of additional space. And we finally decided that uh, this is maybe not the way to go because maybe you even have the situation where both of these microcontrollers are not available. So uh, the idea now would be if the microcontroller is not available, then you can redesign your board. But uh, because we are using the Zephyr operating system, it's just a few lines of code, literally. So you just need to change the board definition and then you can use a different microcontroller for, for the BMS. So that makes it easy uh, and uh, yeah, avoids too much effort. Great. Um, and then as a last one, uh, I would like to, to know what for you was the most helpful besides the funding that an access provided, obviously to, to make your work um, on this possible, but besides the funding that, that an access provides, what other support or help of um, yeah, the, the services or the, the package that an access provides, uh, you have been appreciated and has been helpful for you. And yeah, would be good if you share a bit with us to hear it again, but also with the participants of this work. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there are several aspects uh, where I got help and uh, yeah, where we really worked uh, together uh, with the Nexus Foundation, which was uh, really a great experience. So one of them uh, was uh, technical discussions in our regular meetings. So at the very beginning with Fabio and now also with you, uh, we had some uh, discussions about uh, parts uh, and design considerations and so on. So also on the deep technical level, um, then on the non-technical level, uh, I really appreciated that uh, NXS has uh, experience with the promotion of the BMS and has a huge network of uh, other people and companies in the energy access sector. And uh, yeah, this is sometimes something that I, I don't take care of too much because I'm focused on the technical part and then uh, yeah the promotion of the the ideas so it's it's not worth any anything is if no one knows it so that's uh, really one of the uh, parts that uh, Nexus provided help with great so yeah we, we are happy to to hear that and this is obviously part of our work we want um, our companies we work with to, to profit from our outreach that we have in the sector, from our promotional activities that we provide, from our network we have within the energy access sector so that, uh, yeah, your innovations get the attention that, 
they need to get because yeah, there's great stuff that you are doing and that others are doing that, that needs to be seen in the sector so, so it can be used and adopted properly. Um, so thank you for, for these uh, more detailed insights on, on some aspects of the BMS uh, and how we have been able to support your process. Um, I would now head over to you, Martin, to provide us with a very like brief uh, introduction, how to get started with the BMS if somebody wants actually to say, okay, I want this, this is great. I want to test it or I want to produce it and uh, manage my battery with uh, this open BMS. How could you guide us a bit how to approach this uh, in the easiest way? Sure. Um, yeah, so um, there's a lot of material actually, uh, which you need to to build and use the BMS. And uh, so, um, yeah, probably the best starting point is really the NXS website, where you click on the materials button at the top, and then you can uh, click on the battery management system and get to this page, which uh, provides a summary of all the links that are required uh, for the BMS. And the most important ones are the um, link to the firmware repository and to the hardware repository. Uh, these are all hosted on GitHub, so you can post your issues or send pull requests. Um, and yeah, the, the page for the BMS hardware, for example, looks like this. Um, yeah, it provides a really draft overview of what the BMS is and uh, contains lots of links to the documents uh, required to understand the BMS and get started with it. So one is the PDF file of the schematic. There's of course also the uh, native KiCad file, which you can use, uh, but a PDF uh, is easier to access if you just want to have a, a short look. Then we've got the bill of materials as a normal CSV file and an interactive bill of materials, uh, which I will show in the next slide and uh, a link to the firmware repository and the manual and some mechanical design files as well. The uh, user manual, which is also linked in the previously shown page, contains all the information you need to uh, integrate the battery, uh, the BMS into a battery pack. For example, here it shows where to connect the chargers or the loads, where to connect the battery cells um, in this connector and the temperature sensors and it contains lots of other yeah, information how to, to use it. Then uh, this is this interactive HTML bomb I just mentioned. It's an export from uh, the KiCad program. And it's really useful if you want to build the BMS or also if you have, want to have an understanding of what the components on the BMS are. So you, you get this uh, bill of materials at the left side and you can click on those uh, lines and then it shows you, it highlights the parts uh, on the right side uh, yeah, corresponding to the entry in the list. And this really helps for manufacturing and understanding. Um, then there is the firmware GitHub repository. Yeah, you can of course have a look into the source code itself, but uh, maybe as a starting point, it would be best to look into the render documentation, which is linked at the top right corner here. And this will uh, bring you to another website, which looks like this. And uh, it yeah shows the basic features of the BMS firmware. It shows how to set up the uh, workspace based on the Zephyr Artos and uh, also shows you how to flash the firmware. And at the very bottom, you see the API reference where you can see the different functions uh, and how to call them so that you can uh, get an easier understanding of the firmware. And last but not least, the uh, communication protocol we are using, it's called uh, ThinkSet and uh, it uh, it's the same protocol that we use for the serial interface and for Bluetooth, and it can also easily be integrated into uh, via internet and cloud infrastructure via MQTT. It's all documented in the thingset.io website. And yeah, the basic concept is that you send uh, some JSON data from the device or to the device, and with this data, you can configure the uh, BMS. For example, you can set different voltage thresholds for over voltage or under voltage and so on. 
and you can read out measurement values, uh, basically do everything uh, you need uh, to interact with the BMS. And for doing that, we also provide an open source uh, mobile app. It's developed in Flutter. You see the link uh, down below, but it's not, so this app is still in the, in progress, it works with, uh, and I've only tested this with Android so far. Um, but yeah, there, there will come some more advanced features in the future. Currently it's uh, sufficient uh, to set the thresholds and get some voltage measurements and so on, uh, but it will be improved in the future. Yeah, that's everything from my side. Thank you, Martin. Um... Yeah, I have to say very, very impressive always when I look at all the work that you've done and how you've done it, like the very high quality documentation. I mean, the very high quality battery management system, the very high quality documentation uh, of the work you have done, which is an essential part for, for a good open source project. So it makes it easy to access and understand and actually adopt, improve, um, uh, the work that you have done. So uh, congratulations for, for that again. Um, which brings us to the Q&A session now, where uh, I would be happy to take now the time to answer some of the questions that have been raised um, during the, this call uh, in the chat. So uh, yeah. let, let me tell you the first question, um, which I have here noted, uh, I think by Oscar from Okra Solar. Uh, how is the cell balancing done? Uh, is it an active or passive? Um, um, yeah. yeah. And so the next one would be, one, yeah. yeah, maybe it would be a bit related. What's the balancing capability uh, in Ampere per cell? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a passive balancing and uh, we actually discussed at the very beginning if we should uh, implement a pass. Uh, sorry, did I say active? It's passive balancing. That's what you said. Uh, and, okay. Uh, and we considered uh, implementing an active balancing, but uh, really struggled to find a cheap solution for that. So there are some chips by uh, linear technologies and uh, Texas Instruments and so on, which are so expensive that if you apply them for the 16 cells you almost pay the same price for as for the the whole rest of the bms just for these chips there are some um yeah cheaper chinese not very well documented parts which we also could not get so we finally decided that we'll stay with uh, passive balancing for now and uh, yeah you really need active balancing you could put it in between the um, the cell connection so between the bms and the cell connection and you could put an additional board to have that so uh, as, a, as a kind of modular approach and uh, yeah we understand that this is uh, maybe a, a small drawback if you want to use it for second life applications for example uh, but yeah uh, that's that was a decision uh, yeah also taking the cost of the design into consideration. The um, balancing current is uh, 100 milliamps maximum. That's what the chip provides. Per, per cell, right? Per One cell, yes. Per cell, yeah. right. And it's currently limited to four cells at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, because the chip could get too hot, uh, I have not tested if uh, more cells are possible. Possibly, yes. It also depends on the ambient temperatures. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, great. Uh, I, I think the, this answers the question um, quite precisely. So there's a follow-up question. Uh, oh, next question also by Oscar. Um, what is the search capability? I mean, you state like 100 amps continuous, but uh, what would be like the, for, for a few seconds maximum current? Yeah, I guess uh, 200 amps for three seconds should be doable, uh, even though I haven't tested it yet. Uh, also, uh, the full 100 amps capability haven't been tested yet. Uh, we're still uh, so yeah, the, the initial tests were without the um, heatsink. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I've got a test set up with the heatsink and I got a new test equipment, which can go to up to 100 uh, amps, uh, 120 amps. 
they could test uh, that, but not 200. Uh, but I think that's not not a problem. So the MOSFETs are really uh, they they can really handle lots of current, but um, the problem is more how to get rid of the heat over time. So three seconds should be doable, I would say. Great. Um, that's cool and, and, and good to know. And um, yeah, as as you can see, we are well, Martin and Deepasola are currently like terminating this project. I mean, terminate is always complicated with open source projects. Um, as they, the idea is that they always go on. Um, but yeah, it's designed for 100 amps, and we are happy if uh, companies or interested in the BMS want to run tests. So, um, especially the ones which can be destructive tests to see how much uh, amps we can actually uh, run through, through the BMS and to see where's the limit. This is always uh, interested, because, interesting because it's, it's valuable information, but comes with some cost because afterwards the, your BMS is not usable anymore. Um, so let's come to, the, uh, to another question that I've noted here. Um, what was the raw production cost uh, which you achieved uh, for the prototype runs. So we are not talking about scale, but maybe you can also give some uh, assumptions yeah. for, for scale. Yeah. And maybe also compare so, with um, proprietary ones which have similar specs that your open BMS that you are aware of. Yeah, 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 sure. So um, yeah, the production cost of the, the BMS, including cables, the temperature sensor and connectors, uh, was uh, almost exactly 140 euros uh, with a quantity of 25 boards uh, and produced in Germany locally. So uh, we really didn't uh, yeah, try to lower the cost uh, and we took a yeah, company, an assembly company that we knew and uh, yeah, have it produced locally. I would estimate if you find some cheaper components. For example, the terminals were quite expensive, like three euros something per terminal. And uh, yeah, if you have an integrated solution where, for example, you already know that the cables are going here or there, then you could easily change the BMS design a little bit and maybe solder the wires directly onto the board or have another uh, different solution for the terminals and save a lot of cost and also for a larger quantity, obviously, cost would go down. So I would estimate uh, it can go down to 50 euros. Depending a little bit on the really the current you need. Uh, the MOSFETs we are using at the moment are from a Chinese buyer called, uh, I forgot the name actually, they are in the schematic and not the, the um, Infinium ones. So they are also a huge cost driver. But yeah, that's the ballpark numbers. And uh, for in terms of uh, competitor BMSs, so what I've seen on the market uh, is usually around 400 to 500 euros for uh, BMS systems that are comparable to this one. And yeah, obviously they, they need to put some margin uh, on their uh, production costs. Uh, yeah, so, but if, if you need a BMS in, inside your battery system and uh, yeah, this BMS suits your needs, then uh, you could just go ahead and let it be produced for the, the much lower cost than if you buy an off the shelf one. Sure, no, this is great and uh, impressive figures. Um, I mean, still, as you said, the producing might come with some sourcing problems still for some time. But yeah, once this is figured out, yeah, this is an impressive price difference, actually. Um, uh, this like 400 uh, years you mentioned is for passive balancing so without active balancing or would so this is really also with active uh, with passive with balancing. passive so like really the same specs um, this is uh, yeah impressive so um for companies interested in using a bms and saving quite some money <laughs> on it uh he might be one which uh, could be interesting for you um I, I have also a question um, from my side. Um, what, what are the like next steps you would see as the most? I mean, for sure you have like hundred things in mind that could be improved or changed or whatever. But if you could like name two, maximum three features uh, or improvements or changes 
that you could figure be interested or value for for this BMS um, either as like a, a second one, possibly one with an active balancing, uh, just an example, or just an improvement or change to the to the current one, which would make it either cheaper or better, um, yeah, or whatever two or three features you could uh, imagine that would be a good uh, further development. Yeah, so I would say uh, most important, of course, is uh, to do a bit more testing uh, with the existing BMS boards we have available. And um, yeah, we're also currently testing the board with uh, five other companies uh, from the energy access sector. So they are our, fairly, uh, our early adopters. And uh, yeah, one of those companies is also quite involved in uh, SO. SOH and SOC, so state of health and state of uh, charge algorithm development. And I think that could be another aspect of improvement. Uh, so to, to go ahead on the software side and improve these functions where you can really get into uh, lots of sophisticated details to predict the, the state of the battery better. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would also be something where people can easily uh, contribute because uh, yeah you don't need uh, any additional hardware development um, yeah also communication protocols for example if there is a specific inverter that's used commonly in lots of applications then we could uh, add the firmware and uh, add, add the communication for this inverter to the firmware and then it could be a drop in um, yeah communication and uh, one very important, but maybe a little bit utopian goal uh, would be that the BMS uh, would be produced locally in lots of different locations. Mm -hmm. So that it's not, not produced uh, only in China and then shipped to East Africa, for example, but that it would be yeah, so that the value addition uh, stays in the countries where uh, the, for the, the product is used. And that's also one of the key aspects of open source, in my in my opinion, that this can be achieved. I I think we pretty much align on that one, and it's uh, also part is of the mission as an of an access, which I like mentioned at the very beginning. And um, ju just to follow up on that one, is there what, uh, how, aware or what 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 is your knowledge about the available manufacturing? capabilities and uh, locally so uh, and, and sourcing so i mean which infrastructure is there is there any like changes you would need to the current pcp a design to make it easier to manufacture locally and talking about the whole manufacturing like the pcb and the pcba um or do you think actually it's possible it's just about sourcing because i mean we possibly won't start producing all single parts of it locally this is maybe um i don't know uh, is there is there anything that you're already aware of um maybe you could give some insights shortly on this last one because then i think we have close to soon to close this great webinar um yeah i think it's really mainly about sourcing. Uh, I don't okay. have that much experience with production mm -hmm. in, uh, let's say, East Africa, but we talked uh, to one supplier in Rwanda some time ago. And uh, yeah, they said that sometimes it's difficult to get the parts because of customs requirements and so on. And that's that's one of the tricky parts. And uh, yeah, of, of course, you need some manufacturing machines, but that's all doable, I would say. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, if, if someone has uh, of the audience has experience, uh, I'm also happy to to get in contact uh, with the people who have uh, interest in producing the BMS or other open source hardware. Great, I mean, great, great to hear, and I think that aligns also with our understanding that I mean, the, the manufacturing um, should not be a problem today in in either Western or Eastern Africa for this kind of BMS should totally be possible. That the sourcing of parts. Uh, or special parts might, might be the challenge, but it's even challenging in Europe today. So um, there, there, there's, there's possibly not such, that's a big difference, but a, a call to everybody listening here today. So 
if you have insights are interested in, in pushing the local manufacturing also because you're using them maybe in Eastern or Western Africa, or you aim to use this BMS uh, in these areas, um, happy to reach out to us or uh, Martin at Igosola or both of us and to see what we can do about uh, this aspect because we would love driving, um, using this open source approach to driving the, the local uh, production and yeah, driving the costs down for everybody. Um, I think with that we can come to an end uh, of this webinar. Thank you, uh, Martin, one for the development of this great uh, open battery management system uh, and for the being available for our questions today um, and uh, the walkthrough to how to get started. I hope it was helpful to potential adopters. And lastly, I want to uh, thank you also the audience um, to be here today for our team uh, at the Nexus for uh, organizing and supporting this and especially uh, to Anna to for this nice introduction and setting up this uh, webinar. Um, and as a last point, uh, please be aware that we have uh, an adoption help program. That means we don't only fund new innovations as we have done with the open source battery management system for Martin. Um, we also have um, our head of a product adoption um, who takes care if you need any particular help in adopting any open innovation, for example, the open battery management system or any else of our materials that you find of our homepage and which I have introduced at the beginning of this webinar. Uh, feel free to reach out to help at nexus.org and uh, we will be happy to, to see how we can help and um, organize further steps that might be necessary to, to you to facilitate the adoption of any of the open source innovations that you find uh, in our uh, repository. So thank you for attending and have a great day and uh, soon a great weekend, just one day left to go. So bye-bye. Bye-bye.